Hi, Rokas. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Got to to meet you. So uh, before we start this uh, conversation, there's a couple of things that I um, I really want you to know. So the first one is there's many reasons why I started doing this job, but one big reason is your channel, Martial Arts Journey, really going against the grain and really challenging your own beliefs, etc. And that really drove me to do a lot of research and experiment a lot of growth and a lot of self-reflection and studies. So that's one thing. Uh, one of the reasons why there's Shady is because of you, and I'm very grateful for that. What you put out is amazing. And also they say, you know, never stop what you're doing. You never know who you're encouraging. So thank you. And another thing is that um, I know I see you wear the bat a lot. And, uh, well, I think there's something very important uh, you should know. Oh, nice. You're Superman. <laughs> That's awesome. You ask me if I bleed, consider this mercy. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's really cool. Nice. Yeah, well, I, I wanted to say the same, man. And, you know, we spoke about this, but not on record, is that I got to see your channel in the, in the early stages and I saw the potential behind it. Uh, and uh, it's great that you, first of all, you found a missing voice, uh, which I wasn't. I was never going to cover judo. I mean, maybe I'll, I'll dabble in it, but, you know, it's not my thing and that was not covered. And so so you found something that was missing and you started to fill that hole. You also found another misconception in martial arts, the whole, which I'm pretty sure we'll talk about, but the whole judo versus BJJ and you delivered your voice there. I think it's just brilliant. I really love what you're doing and it's great to see your channel grow. So, yeah, it's uh, it's super cool. And, and it's also, too, it means a lot to me to know, like you when you said, it's entirely it's entirely true. We never know fully who is impacted by what we do, and most of the times we don't even get to know that. But but when you know, like, oh, actually, there's there's something happening here. It's just it's amazing. So thank you for letting me know that. I I still remember, uh, man. It's so crazy. I I was actually training at Le Cercle Tissier under Christian Tissier and Bruno Gonzalez. Like that's. Every Aikidoka's, excuse my language, wet dream, basically, to go and train there. And uh, before um, before I traveled to France here in 2016, 2017, um, I used to train in Lebanon, Aikido. And there is a very, you know, I don't know if it's the same as Lithuania, but it's a hostile environment. Yeah. Um, especially where I grew up, street fights were very common. If you're walking down the streets, you're bound to see two people, you know, going at it, uh, it was very common. So uh, I'm sure my audience knows this with the bullying and how I grew up in public school. Um, it was basically a, a school where, you know, where, you know, their children repeated multiple um, classes or multiple years, repeated them. And basically that's the last resort. They would put them in that particular school. So everyone was a lot larger than me. So I was in sixth grade, they were 16 years old in my class. So that's one reason. And uh, I, was, I would train, I, when I started training in college, uh, so when, when I grew up, I couldn't afford it. But when I got to college, they said, you know, show us your college ID and you can train for free. And there was only Aikido and Taekwondo. So my Aikido instructor, uh, and we'll get to the uh, similarities, like uh, don't cross train and don't watch YouTube videos. It's yeah. later on. Um, he he actually had like a big background in kickboxing and he was like a 6'2 bodybuilder just a huge man and like with big forearms and he would teach us on monday boxing drills and we would we would try to attack the other guy and we would do these uh, aikido blocks which really uh, helps put out a very good reflex actually it's not just yoko man and grabs and right so that really build up a lot of good reflex in me and I really liked the training and, and he started doing that from the very beginning. So I figured that that's it, you know, and I started, um, you know, evolving. I got my Ikkyo in Lebanon and I traveled to France and there I joined, you know, Le Cercle Tissier and uh, it was like your dream come true. Basically yeah. you're traveling, you're doing your master's degree in the best school in France and you're training with the best in the world in Aikido. And I started, they were, 
they were really going at it Aikikai like. Mm. Um, like I, Christian Tissier goes really for the basics and adds a lot of details to them. He, um, he really focuses on Atemi. Atemi is important in my opinion. If you've seen Nishio, I'm sure you've seen his uh, yeah. stance on Atemi. But also I would train with Bruno Gonzalez and Bruno Gonzalez really like to, to um, demonstrate the Aiki spirit, not so much um, Aikido as an art, like the basics with Atemi, you know, you, you kind of still see some martial aspects of it. With Bruno, it's all flow, it's all mm -hmm. harmony, it's, it's the Aikido spirit rather than um, martial arts, basically. And I really thought that, you know, this would never work. Like, what the hell? And, I, and here I am, I'm about to get my black belt and, and here all these doubts start to happen. And it wasn't like when I was training, you know, someone going for jabs and cross and I'm, and we would do randori with, in uh, Lebanon, like with our hands back and like against four and they're trying to kick and they're trying to slap you and you would just move around Taisabaki. So a, a lot of good stuff actually. Mm. Um, mm. But when I went and I came here or Mawashigeri, like the sidekicks, there was nothing. And I said, like, this would never work. Never, never in a million years. And I got my black belt and I was still very skeptical. I took like a month break from training. And there I saw the faithful talk you had with Roy Dean. Okay. And so many similarities, like, oh my God, this, like you could easily relate. And you're like, okay, I'm not the only one. That's like, that's exactly how I'm feeling. And uh, yeah. when he, when he, <laughs> especially when he said, um, you know, you don't know anything until your third down or fourth <laughs> down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there was always this idea that, you know, once you're second, third down, and then they start to teach you the um, the secret potion recipe, if you want. You know, like how to how to do the Aikido, I guess an uppercut or like a straight jab or someone who's like this close and then hit, headbutts you. But there was none of that, you know. You, you And you keep telling yourself, you know what, the patient is the one that gets there. You know, you keep giving yourself these little uh, comforting words, but, you know, in self-defense, you know, it, you might get out of the house right now and get attacked. So you need to be as efficient, as fast as possible. Yes, I understand there's patience and uh, evolution in your game, but you need to have some sort of base and quickly. Sure. And that's when I said, you know what, let's try a BJJ class. Because uh, BJJ in uh, the CFTCA was actually seven days a week like a few times a day and there's open mat every noon which is crazy so and there was judo twice a week only so i was like okay let's do bjj then because i'll have all this time to to, to train um and you know you, you get choked out and uh, you really enjoy it and you're like i want to do this forever and uh and that was it but, but after wait oh wait, uh, i forgot one thing when i yeah. first wore my black belt and got into class and started training at first it feels good but then I came to a very, I mean, this might sound very silly, but um, I came to a conclusion that I'm so bored. Like this yeah, is... Oh yeah, I've been there. <laughs> I, I think nobody speaks about that, but I'm pretty sure 90% of Aikidoka at higher ranks feel that way. You can, you can see that even like, like uh, and I'll, I'll quickly jump in and let you continue. But I remember going to big seminars and you would see the, the higher dancer just like, uh, we're doing this again we're, unless there's something like new and challenging but most of the times they're just like they they have this you know face of uh <laughs> you know what i'm talking about right oh yeah and then i was like okay that's it so that's that's the superpowers you earn with your aikido black belt okay that's when i said like let's try a class uh but then you know i was work i was working full-time job as an architect in paris and then going to versailles for uh, studies at night for my management degree so it was really crazy to go back to Vincennes all the way to the other side and train. So I enrolled in judo here next to me, like walking distances from my apartment. And uh, I realized that there was a lot of groundwork mm. uh, and they roll. And it's not just, you know, you throw and then you finish with the arm bar or you get to pin them like you see in competitions. And then I'm like, wait, hold on. Something's happening here. Then we continued and... Um, at first, I didn't immediately start my channel, obviously, but uh, I then realized that there's something here and it, I kept reading and going in and out of old videos. And that's where I realized that there's something else to look at, not just, you know, the old the old narratives that you hear. 
whether it's an Aikido or BJJ. Yeah. True, true. It's uh, you know that's the interesting thing is that there's myths everywhere, and I think at the beginning it's hard to see that. Like it takes a while to. I think you can start to see if if you're really sane and and you're not influenced by anyone, it's easy to see it early on in Aikido. I think in other practices like BJJ, it's harder sometimes to see the the missing parts early. I mean, you can, but it's harder. I think they're not as obvious. Uh, but but when you go down deeper, I think in every practice you'll see like um, just kind of this uh, this conscious bias, I think, or unconscious bias probably is, is more true. Uh, unconscious bias it can be found everywhere. We're, we're, we want to believe the thing we do is the best, and you know it's like the the martial arts wars are everywhere. Like our style is the best, and I think there are in, there are individuals who are better than that, and they understand that it's like no no practice is perfect. But there's a lot of people who who identify so much with their practice that they're like, we're the best. But it's never, you know, it's never just gray, uh, white or black. So yeah. I mean, even on my channel, like as hard as I push judo, um, there's always something else in the discussion, whether it's a little bit of striking, grappling yeah. and other arts compared to judo. Uh, you know, I always... I, try also to point out the stuff that I don't like about judo. For example, um, it's not just the sports aspect. There's also self-defense classes, um, all techniques. You know, uh, in my opinion, I think we should have a big curriculum, you know, mm. that suits all the stuff that judo was intended to do. For example, you know, when you go into judo or BJJ, they're basically preparing you for uh, an IJF competition or like an IBJJF style. Uh, competition. That's your training, basically. I I'm sure, like the there's Valente Brothers or you know, uh, Hells and Gracie academies, they do self defense. But like the 99.9% .9 of all of it is just preparing you for competition, and that's it. Um, I think judo should be a very big school where you have your kata, you have your uh, randori on the ground and standing up, and um, you know, cases training where you. Use do a little bit of scenarios, street self-defense scenarios. You train your reflexes, you know, uh, intercept or block, strike, and then grapple. Uh, you know, just the whole mix. Like you, you see the old masters doing uh, self-defense demonstrations. Uh, and it's not just, you know, okay, we try to grip each other and get the opponent so we can win. Uh, yes, that's very helpful. I, of course, it's resistance. It's aliveness, as uh, Matt Thornton called it. But uh, it's it's missing a lot. For sure. Uh, I think, you know, at the same time, uh, these days, I'm a big fan of Christopher Hein uh, Hein's work. You, you probably bumped into his work already, right? So, and I, I stole this idea from him. But when you go to a boxing gym, and actually, to be honest, I've, I've been in a few boxing gyms, if ever. I'm training kickboxing right now. But but I think it's it's true regarding boxing that when you come in and you don't ask, like, but what do you do if you're kicked? It's like, well, go to kickboxing, you know, if you if you want to kick. Like, they, they're very clear, like, what we are and what we aren't. And I don't think, like, even, like, boxing gyms, we're so, it's so clearly identified as a sport that maybe, obviously, that will work if you're in a street fight. Boxing strikes will work. You won't know what to do when you grapple. But, but you know, some things will work. But I don't, I never saw, personally, a boxing gym which says, learn, let come in learn self-defense and learn this and that it's like no boxing is boxing and i think that's what's brilliant about it it knows where it begins and it knows where it ends and i think there's nothing wrong with martial arts uh not being something like i don't think martial arts need to cover everything including aikido i think that's you probably know from my main narrative that i think that's one of the main flaws with aikido is that it's, it's everything it's like swords and knives and joes and ukemi and it's like there's so much there and it's like it's jack of all trades, master of none situation. But I think if and and it's it could be an, a debate, you know, what should happen with judo, where it should begin and where it should end. But I just wanted to put on record that I don't think it's a problem if Aikido would dub itself as the mar the martial artistic practice of movement. But it's like leave the self defense out of it, leave the pressure testing out of it. Just be clear that that we're just doing this nice choreography. I think it would be fine. But the problem is when there's a claim that we're doing this, but we're not. I'm sure you know what I mean. Uh, 
what what I meant to say with uh, with judo is that uh, like when judo first started, uh, yes, there were jujitsu schools competing against each other, uh, but it was mainly for to get a spot at the police academy to be mm. uh, one of the main disciplines. Mm. So, for example, if you go to a police academy in Tokyo and train judo, I'm sure it's not going to be like the Kodokan. So, mm. uh, I think we should have both options. And also, you know, uh, there is now this idea um, that uh, I see people in my comments all the time saying, I train this, 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 this. I don't want to live in an MMA camp just to learn self defense. I think, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, I sure. Everyone right. has different philosophies approaching martial arts. I've started, I've started in 2013, and it's still the same. Mental fortitude, confidence, but mainly self-defense. I think judo, um, I mean, I might sound very obvious, but it started for self-defense and police and really protecting yourself. And I think that you want to go to sports, you want to compete, you have great genetics, you have uh, great potential, please go do that. But let's not only do that i think you know we should have big classes like kodokan and they serve for everything kata competition recreational judo in, in kodokan you have recreational judo just mm. adult black belts going in they spar they have fun with each other and that's it mm. you should also have self-defense coupled with the kata because if you go to the kodokan website they say judo is like studying education uh, competition sports they say kata and self-defense so that's very good that they separated the two mm. yeah i think we should have that like if i i want to go i emphasize these classes or maybe after i compete i go more the self-defense route i don't want like i said i don't want to do muay thai and uh, bj no gi bjj and then go to judo and then go do greco roma wrestling for my step like i don't first of all i don't have the time nor do i have the money so i think we should have uh, the self-defense aspect, uh, training the basic attendees of all judo, uh, with uh, coupled with reflexes, and then you know we all go do grappling randori, standing up and stand on the ground. That's like an art gallery, or I'm sorry, an art school. That's you know you should be learning oil painting, uh, watercolor painting, sculpting, charcoal drawing, etc. But they're only limited to pencil drawing, which is competition mm -hmm. for sport. It's sure. in my opinion that's wrong. Sure. You know, I I have to say that judo is, is a pretty unfamiliar realm for me. I, I know very little of it, especially compared to you. Uh, but uh, I was thinking about a similar point in Aikido back in the day where I was considering that uh, maybe that could be a solution, like, or even different schools could focus on different things. Like, let's say this school is all about Aikido realistically working for self-defense. And this you go to this school, we're like, we're, we're all fluffy, touchy-feely. We're all about the philosophy. It's like, or or a single school could also cover that, or or maybe there could be, and that's what I used to think at least, that there could be like a curriculum where it's like, okay, three times per week we train uh, touchy feely philosophical Aikido, but then on Saturdays we will teach you to to strike, to deal with strikes, and and I think that's kind of what Christopher Hine is doing. I still I still want to touch my hands on his Aikido, and that's that's yet to happen. But uh, from our conversations, I think that's what he's aiming for is where he's not trying to make his Aikidoka into boxers, grapplers, and and judoka, you know. Yeah. Right. But he's but he's giving them enough so that they would be able to deal in those situations. But again, the goal is is not to uh, you know outstrike a boxer and out grapple a grappler and i think that's that that's the smart part but to completely ignore that i think yeah that's uh, and and you also touched an important point which i think not everyone admits but i think it's true that most people the majority of people if like i'd say like 95 percent of people probably go to martial arts for self-defense i think the number is definitely very high and that changes later on. Maybe you're like, oh, actually, now I'm interested more in competition or the philosophy of it. But I think majority of people start going to martial arts for self-defense. And I think schools, martial arts schools should consider that and should honor that and either tell from the get-go. It's like, I, and I used to do that in my Aikido school, especially in the last few years. Uh, I would say, this is not a self-defense school. If you want to learn self-defense, go somewhere else. 
Uh, but I think it would be also cool if, uh, and I think at the very last couple of years when I started developing, uh, I became a certified spear instructor, like a self-defense system. I was dabbling in self-defense a lot. I started training MMA and BJJ. And I would sometimes, I, I would occasionally be like, oh, and if, if this person would really do this, then you would do this. But we're not going to train that day or just try this a little bit and then let's come back to fluffy, touchy-feely things, you know. So I think, yeah, why not? That That could be good. For example, the striking in all judo, if you look at the kata and the demonstrations, it's meant to serve the grappling part mm. as a way to get into your grappling mm. and also train your reflexes. So again, just like Christopher Hines says, you know, I'm not going to box a boxer or you know, clinch with a Muay Thai guy to play his game because I'll lose. But, you know, it's a good way to train my reflexes against strikes and also get to my grappling. That's that's the whole point. And now regarding weapons, I don't know what they do, but if you look at police kendo and judo, police judo, it's, it's completely different. For example, even in competition, police kendo, they sweep each other's legs, he goes mm. down to the ground and strikes his head. Yeah, it, It's really cool stuff. And uh, I think we're missing out a lot just by doing uh, sports. Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, again, uh, naturally, I, most of the times I fall back to my to comparing it to my Aikido experience because that's the, you know, the thing I did most. But I think there's always a lot of parallels. I think Aikido is an extreme version of what happens to most martial arts. It's kind of on the far left, per se, and other martial arts are going towards that. And there's the far right. Anyway, uh, so but yeah, there's there's reference points there. And uh, I think a lot of people would ask, including myself, or would wonder, what if somebody would jab or what if somebody would cross or hook and that question would come up but you know the aikido senses would be taught from generation to generation to basically downplay it and be like oh yeah you're just you just it's kind of like yoko minuchi you just you just keep on doing it and if somebody strikes you'll just get to it you'll just naturally respond which is utter bullshit you know but the sensei said so and the other thing is or they give a has f uh some kind of weird semi technique where it's like i guess this would work but the question does come up all the time so for the instructor and i think that that's what's what's crazy you know aikidoka invests so many years to train so many complicated different techniques including sword work and joe work etc but it's like why can't you invest a month at least and do some boxing especially if you're a black belt you're like, your game is going to elevate to such a different degree and, and you'll be able to answer your the questions that your students ask you, especially if you're an instructor, much better. But for some reason, most people don't do that. And I wonder if that's the case in judo as well. I mean, yeah, if you're only, like, just like a wrestler or any group, like great, I mean, these are grapplers who spar actually, but uh, you need to add that missing element for you know street because you know the first thing they're gonna do is most likely slap you or uh push you shove you maybe you know yeah. it's different i mean um, if they grab you they lose that... each other okay you hear me? um i think my thought was about adding boxing into your curriculum for at least a month if you're high ranking Aikidoka and uh, not sh shunning away from the fact that most people will ask you those questions and most people come to martial arts for self-defense. And I, I think I inquired, what do you think about the same in judo? I think uh, that, that that's the same thing with, you know, adding self-defense curriculum and training your reflexes and really training how to jab uh, the old strikes that are very much like uh, karate. Uh, like the Huracan going in, really striking. They have like particular strikes like on the on the chin between the eyes, on the temple, uh, the solar plexus, the groin. They have a very detailed uh, curriculum for strikes in Judo, which is old. And uh, it can do a lot of damage. Like you strike, uh, as Nishio said, like that strike should end it all, basically. Um, mm. Kind of like drawing to sword, and finishing you yeah, see you see that uh, del deleted scene from last samurai or no last samurai yeah where the guy yeah. cuts the head off 
yes like have you seen like uh they were taunting him I and mean, he says like are you even japanese and then it was like just he drew the sword put it yeah, back yeah. in basically i mean that that's how a strike should be it should like completely mm. de- 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 debilitate them sure i see what you mean yeah yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. My English is not my first language. I'm sorry for the viewers. Same so. here. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we should train, you know, not like a boxer, but a means to really serve your grappling and also to uh, accustom yourself to strikes and also just mainly a good reflex. It's it's very simple, but it should it takes a lot of work. Oh, for sure. Yeah, it's like that. That's the interesting thing. Again, if we take and I find the most, this could apply to various practices, but I find boxing to be the most fascinating example of this, that boxing has only six strikes, you know, jab, cross, hook, left hook, right hook, left uppercut. You can do like body shots maybe, but it's like, that's it. And you can do them for like your whole life and you're going to have stuff to work on and you're never going to run out of things. But then, you know, that's my pet peeve with Aikido. You have a thousand techniques at least, and you have to become good at all of them, and none of them work. It's like, why don't we just choose a couple which work and really, you know? And that's the same with with BJJ. Like most of BJJ competitions are won by the same techniques, and I wouldn't be surprised if the same is. I do not know the answer, but I wouldn't be surprised if the same is with judo. Like, like you know, the throws. But I can name five that like ninety percent of the win. Right, that's and that's the thing, you know. It's like people come up with new stuff and they surprise people. I mean, I'm speak, speaking about BJ, but again, I'm not surprised if the same applies to judo. It's a grappling. You have to really uh, set up for whatever you're doing, and if they don't see it coming, you win. Right, but the thing is, and Matt Thornton talks about that. That uh, works for only a while until everyone catches on, and everyone's like, "Ah, oh, that's how it works," and everybody knows that by year two or three, and you can't catch them any, anymore it's like the same with uh aikido wrist locks and i'm still just starting to dabble with them in bjj but it's fairly possible to get people with a solid aikido um wrist lock in in the you know rolling but then the second time it's nearly impossible because people are like they're looking for it they know it's coming and and you're like okay i'm done <laughs> so you know what i mean i guess thinking about that the other day for example someone has your like, going for a seat belt you can easily turn towards them with a sankyo true or, that's a good uh, point i should try that <laughs> and uh you know like a collar grip you do a nikyo i i okay. think i saw you do that and yeah there's yeah. good stuff or for example if you're someone's half guard and they're turning towards you you can do a nikyo right yeah and you know that's i'm actually i don't know when this is going to be on record but speaking from where we are now next week i'm going to release or i'm planning to release a video where i asked my bgg instructor here in lithuania who's a a black belt uh to to let me try some aikido moves on him like while doing some light uh, stand-up grappling and it was pretty cool you know some stuff came up uh but the thing is and that's the really fascinating part which I, i was already familiar with that but I really saw it in action. When I would show him, I would first try to catch him with those moves until he would know them. But then, then I would later show the move, the moves. And he's he's very good to begin with. But he was able to tell me like, oh, actually, you know what? You should position yourself here. You should use your body more. You should connect it with your chest. And he was teaching me how to do an Aikido technique in BJJ, although he never did Aikido. But the thing is, that's that's the thing that, First, what matters are the fundamentals that you would feel comfortable in in the whole gra- uh, we're probably speaking about BJJ and the whole grappling game or the same in striking. I, I still didn't really try to apply Aikido in striking, but I'm sure that now I would be able to do it because now I can exchange strikes and I can look for openings and I can look for setups because I feel comfortable. At the beginning, when you're just trying to survive and you're blinking every time someone strikes and you're panicking and there's adrenaline, your Aikido, you know, is not gonna come up because you you don't feel comfortable there and you don't have the fundamental ground or stance or or so many things are missing. But then that's the thing, you know, and I think that's where I I, I, I like I'd like to come back to your statement that these things would be good to train. It would be good for a judoka per se. To become comfortable at 
fundamental striking. It's like know the weapon of your um, enemy per se. <laughs> you know, it's like if you know how to strike, if you know how striking feels, you don't need to become the master of it. But then you can become comfortable and adapt your game to that game. So I think, but in, unless you, it's like that's. I think that's a myth, which is very common in Aikido, and we spoke about that already before. That if you're gonna train pure Aikido all the time, you're just gonna be magically good against everyone. It's like no, that's not how it works. Stuff that we do indirect training, and there's direct training. Um, for example, the the bands we do in judo, like for the throwing, and I mean that's indirect training. If you did that alone, that's that's not going to do anything. But uh, when you're teaching that your body to move at a blink of an eye, that turn around and really throw someone, because when it, whenever you talk about you know the shoulder throw, they say you're giving your back, etc. But when you're doing it like on a bolt of lightning and you see it in BJJ, like, people are not stopping it. You know, yeah. the same the same way I would think that whenever someone shoots on my legs, like I can easily do a knee strike, you know, like we saw, but you'd have to be a really professional knee striker to really stop a wrestler with your knee because they've drilled yeah. it so many times against, you know, how many times you've drilled a knee strike, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, there's a reason they, these techniques survived in high level competition. Right. Uh, and, and, and that's... That's the thing with Aikido. I think, you know, I've discussed it once. I called it how to make Aikido work, parentheses, in my opinion. And I was basically saying, you know, just add judo grips and kuzushi, like the, the unbalancing. And then once they're like this, then you can do basically whatever you want to them, which is true. Uh, but uh, I think, and this is going to sound crazy, I think we should leave it be. Let me tell you why. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, let me tell you why we should leave it be. Um, not try to add sparring, not try to do this or that. I think Aikido should be taught um, in the same, I would say, logical conclusion as Osensei came to it. Mm. Meaning, uh, he trained, I was watching this the other day, he trained in several jujitsu schools, not just um, mm. Daitoryu. Everyone thinks that it's just Daitoryu. But mm. uh, he also went to the army. He trained martial arts for. In the, uh, he trained the other soldiers. He was uh, in the infantry. He went to war, I think, against Russia. And then he had those three visions where it slowly became more and more, you know, more about peace philosophy. He also went to Manchuria. It, the, the whole story. Um, that kind of reasoning throughout the decades, you cannot teach it to someone, like you cannot just transfer his martial skills to someone just through Aikido. Yeah. Uh, sure. Like for, I'll, I'll give you an example. Someone that's, let's say, went to uh, Stanford or Harvard or whatever, and they have like a PhD in literature. They've read countless books uh, on life, how to, like, you know, how every book changes your perception on life a little bit, um, your life experiences, your relationship with people. You, he cannot come and just have like a talk with a 12 year old and expect to give them his, the same level of understanding. That 12 year old has to go through the same thing. Mm. Yeah. So I think to really, I don't, I don't know if it's the correct word, harness Aikido or mm. to really understand it. I mean, I feel like I understand it now more than when I was doing Aikido. Sure. Uh, I think, you either have to tell them, you know, hey, this is just his meditation throughout the end, and that's it. Hey, you want to come? You're welcome. And this is the story. I think you should know the story. There's no such thing as self-defense and deadly for MMA. I think you killed that myth very well. But uh, or someone that has competed, let's say they're 25 and they started competed at five years old in judo. 20 years is a very long time, and Maybe they have injuries, maybe they, they got fed up with it, they don't want to do it anymore. Then you know what? I think now I can really appreciate and absorb Aikido and then do it. The sword, understand where all these moves come from with the sword. Even judo, like there's a lot of judo throws that come from like the sword. I, I think about them sometimes. And 
just you know have the same process like compete injure yourself go through life then appreciate it but just with zero martial experience you don't know how to throw a jab you don't know how to gr grab grip fight and then just do aikido and even if it's just quote unquote philosophy in my opinion is flawed i think we should leave it be but truly like that's it just tell tell it what it is tell people what it truly is and that's it just mm -hmm. like iaido just like kudo just like uh i think you get my point yeah for sure for sure yeah i think well first of all i think aikido is a huge puzzle i think it's a very big puzzle which has a lot of intricate details and it's it's a tough one to solve and i think one of the reasons why it's not solved is because it's such a tough cookie to say so uh so to speak but uh personally i think it could go to two different directions yeah so first one is i'm with you it could just uh make it clear that it's um and it's funny to say ancient because it's not ancient like you know it's fairly you know young but but it's kind of an outdated or cult, it's a cultural experience etc and to just really make it clear like tai chi and even tai chi falls into that trouble sometimes too when they try to promote themselves as functional and we all have seen those videos where the tai chi masters get their ass kicked but most of the tai chi people that i met they're just doing gymnastics and that's fine and as long as they don't try to claim anything else it's a great practice and it's fun to watch and it's i'm sure it's fun to do so aikido could go the kind of the tai chi way but the other thing the other way i think is uh, where christopher hein is going is to really essentially bring up to the table and uh, and you know he he's the better person to speak about that but but that's my interpretation of his work you you really bring forth of what aikido is supposed to be which is again a huge puzzle because Osensi was such a confusing person to be honest yeah. from what I gather but then basically I think every Aikidoka would agree that Aikido is the art of peace or it's it's about it's about not fighting and we had this short conversation with uh, Chris just recently off record and we were discussing about this that uh, if Aikido's goal is to not fight then why not create a practice which is all about not fighting and the best way to not fight is to, first of all, avoid uh, an in incoming uh, potential threat, to be able to de-escalate it, to be able to get out of grips, to run away. And those are, you know, a lot of people don't understand that these things need to be practiced. I think that's, again, a missing piece puzzle in Aikido, where like, it's or actually in most traditional martial arts or martial arts, where it's like, oh, if if three guys surround you, just push them and run away. It's like, first, let's say so. It's like, but how will you be able to do that if you never practice it that's where scenario uh, training comes in which is i think crucial is to experience that at least to some degree so that your because your brain is not going to work in a stressful situation your reflexes are going to kick in your instincts and if you never trained running away uh from a troublesome situation you won't be good at it you may be lucky but if you train that you'll be much more successful and if aikido would be all about that I think that's I, I like that idea. I think it's it's a pretty cool and interesting idea. Uh, yeah, I I agree. But it, that's that's I think the problem started as you just said uh, when you said Osensei is a very puzzling man. Like you're saying, yeah. it's like just just tell us what you mean because I, I because when if you read Kano's writings, like you can understand them like this, even though they're very deep, but you can. Like anyone can understand them if they put a little bit of thought into them. Right. But uh, I think Kano, in my opinion, nailed it very well. When he talked about education, first of all, it was a dying practice. He saved it. That's one thing. Two, um, when he talked about education, meaning moral, intellectual, and physical education, those three, in my opinion, every martial art should test also and the values. You know, we constantly read. The right things when it comes to because we, we often like to say honor peace respect but like do you like do you practice them even like just like a beginner that or a black belt i'm sorry that comes to class and drills the basics every time i think you should constantly read the values whether it is you know if you're someone that's a christian you can always read your biblical uh like the the letters of paul your bibles or if you're someone that's into stoicism you're maybe you don't believe or but 
you're into Stoicism or Epicureanism or whatever, constantly reread those books because that's the thing about re rereading old books. You're either reminded of something or there's something new that you, before you didn't have the enough maturity to grasp it, just like a technique. But then now you grasped it and also just maybe something completely missed and now you get it. So uh, in my opinion, values, whatever in, in life in general, not just the values of martial arts, you should constantly be studied over and over and over again. But if you study only the art of peace, which is the quotation, I think you're gonna be uh, fairly confused all the time. For sure. Yeah, there's many layers to this, but first of all, especially for people who don't know about more Hiroshiba, the, sorry. <coughs> Bless you. Is many times, sorry. <coughs> Maybe four is not five. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Uh, that's always happening. So, uh, yeah, so more Hiroshi, but super confusing. And I, I won't spend much time here, but but there's a lot of stories where, first, you know, he thought he's the reincarnation of some spirit. He was very, in, he was very much into mystical stuff. And most of his students just straight out did not understand what he's talking about. And some of the deeper translations that are made, they're also like, it's like, you have to know so much about um, Shinto mythology to understand even what he's talking about. And for him, and it seemed natural. I think, sorry? Omoto. Yeah, and Omoto Kiyo, right? So, uh, but then, uh, but then I think, honestly, and, and I, actually there's, there's another point I want to make here, but honestly, I think he wasn't a very good teacher. I think, and that happens. A great master is not necessarily a good teacher and vice versa. And I think he wasn't a very good teacher. He would just come and show a technique and everyone would have to copy or he would talk for an hour. And this is from what I, you know, collected over the years, hearing stories from people who actually met him and reading about it. He would just, you know, talk for a couple of hours. Nobody would understand anything. And it's like, how do you transmit, you know, a martial art like that? And then yeah. when he died, people were just trying to get the pieces together. But um, the other point, that I think even more important that I wanted to make is and in, in, in reference to what you're saying you know that whole martial arts promoting humility and courage and all these values i think it's great that emphasis is put on it but i also think there needs to be practicality there and that's where i like the phrase the right way is the way which works and uh, to talk about it or to read about it may not necessarily be enough and like like uh my I, I guess I'll put it on record. Fuck it. <laughs> but my girlfriend's, my girlfriend's uh, mother, she's a Christian, deeply religious, and she's a homophobic, homophobic, real, uh, racist person. Which is, it's like you know, how can you put those two together? But but there's there are other people Let's like make that. Make sure she doesn't watch my video. <laughs> <laughs> she's she doesn't understand English. So and this is true. You know, it's the truth. She she hates. Right. She's very homophobic and etc. So but she's a great example of conflicting it's like you know if you're a true pressure let's i'll you know, i'll philosophize for a moment but if you're if you're a pressure tested christian you won't be homophobic that that doesn't make sense but if you just have like this theoretical understanding of it you can easily make your own system which won't really make sense but it will make sense to you you'll just cherry pick what you want to believe in yeah yes i, I know i know but uh, that's what I, that, that's not what i meant for example uh what I, what I meant about Christian or whatever, but if, like, if obviously we do things, we think it's best for us, but they're making us worse people. That's just gonna be all, like, there's gonna be people doing that all the time. But I'm saying, for example, if the writings of Marcus Aurelius, you know, they, they turn you more, you know, uh, more into a very, you know, independent stoic man, then please mm. go. So if, uh, for example, my favorite book, and will always be my favorite book, is The Prophet by it's mm -hmm. my favorite. Uh, the way his outlook on life, children, how you uh, how you work, how you should see your work, it really influenced my life. So, and I read it. I don't know how many times for seven years. Seven years, I a little bit more. I discovered that book. I read it, and I've been rereading re it all this time. And there's constantly a reminder, and you know, it really shapes up. Like just like I mentioned earlier, a book should add a little bit of perception into your life, a little bit of value. So that's what I meant by rereading, because sometimes you have to see things differently in order to act differently. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm with you, but there's just a kind of a, a, an extra level I wanted to add to it because, like, Aikido and the philosophy of it and the, the texts of Mori Hiroshiba that I read, uh, especially in my teen and early, you know, adulthood, that definitely impacted my thinking and, and it, it shaped me. But at the same time, uh, this, and this is where I want to come bring the, the pressure testing aspect. Um, what, what shocked me back in the day was uh, that my first batch of black belts, two of them, turned out to be, forgive me for saying that, but douchebags. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they, they, they hate me till today. They, they talk behind my back. Uh, and, uh, and it's, as you know, I kind of still love them, but I also, it's like, what the fuck guys, you know, it's like, and I understand where they're coming from. So it's a long story. It's a complicated story. But the thing is what happened then was that I had a specific image of what an Aikido black belt should be. They did not turn out that way. Like out of four, two didn't. And I was like, and I, I, I didn't blame them. I blame myself because I thought clearly there's something missing in the way I teach that it didn't make sure that this happens. And I'll just, I'll just put an extra point so you would really know what I'm talking about. Uh, and so I'll draw a parallel. There was an experiment where a Martin Luther King was shot, and it's a famous story. And the kids, the teacher was supposed to explain to the kids what happened, why. And she didn't know how to teach young kids to tell them about racism. So she decided to do an experiment. Uh, she, I think it was like the blue eye kids were decided upon that day. She said, oh, research told that blue eye kids are stupid and brown eyes kids are, are smart. And they started labeling them and, and putting them in different positions. And they obviously they ganged up on each other. And later she switched the roles. And she was like, oh, actually, we got the research wrong. The, the blue eye kids are smart and the brown eye kids are stupid. But the thing is, years later, these people were interviewed and they all said that that had a deep impact on their understanding of the world. And they were never judgmental about other races and cultures because they went through direct experience of holy crap you know this is this is what feels to be the minority and this is what racism is and my point is and i'm kind of drawing a big circle here but that's kind of pressure testing you're bound to understand what's racism if you go through experience. that experience but if yeah. the teacher right but if the teacher would just tell about racism maybe free kids would understand free would not so i'm thinking to bring it back to martial arts my question is how can we uh, implement some kind of a system, which is one of the reasons why I admire combat sports, because I think they, they, it's not like a 100% proof system, but it's much more bound to bring in humility in your thinking yeah. because of the nature of being destroyed all the time and always having someone better than you, clearly, versus traditional martial arts, which that aspect is lacking. You become the best and you're the best and you're unquestioned, you're unchallenged. So I think yeah. like that's that's what I wanted to bring is like, if we want to bring values to martial arts, what's the pressure testing mechanism there? So uh, it's, a, it's a kind of a big thought, but yeah. I think I can help with that. Uh, humility, let's start with humility. So I think, um, you know, the saying that, you know, your true colors show when you're in power or when you have money or whatever, or when you're in a good yeah. spot, basically. Right. Uh, another thing is, uh, you know, the hardest thing to do is be humble in victory not just defeat, defeat when you get trashed. You know, a lot of people, yes, they come to their senses, you know, I'm delusional, I need to work a lot more on myself. And there are those that don't last in those types of schools like judo, BJJ wrestling, mm -hmm. where they point on someone else, you know, I, I, they never told me I can do this, they never told me this house, the fight is gonna go, you know, they basically try to lie to themselves to, to basically hide away from the fact that they are defenseless Mm. But also, it's very hard to be um, modest, I would say, in victory. Like, and I'll, I'll give you, this is an extreme example, but uh, mm. um, there was this kendo championship. And, you know, in kendo, you win by striking the wrist, the, the head, the, the torso, and also the throat. Mm -hmm. uh, so one guy scored an ip on his, he struck one of those points. And he went like for a brief second like this. And that Ippon was taken away from him. Mm. Like, obviously, you know, you should not taunt your uh, your opponent when you win. But mm. uh, I think, you know, in my opinion, that's a little bit excessive to take away his win. But uh, it does teach a little bit that, um, you know, just be calm because 
you know, you're not, this will not last, first of all. Yeah. Not, no victory lasts forever. Just like, like I took it away from you, just like that. Um, but at the same time, you know, if you, you, you will not taunt or talk trash on social media or, you know, when you win, um, I think that's a good way of doing it. Obviously, you should set some standards and culture from culture differ. For example, you have, you know, I think, you know, where I come from, like really celebrating and really showing your joy, not necessarily taunting, but, uh, you know, showing your joy, it's acceptable. But, you know, even for me watching that, you know, like fist shake like this and seeing that upon taking, it was hard to wrap my head around it. But in my opinion, that's one of the ways you can pressure test humility. Like if, the, if you take it away from him and he gets really angry, for example, and um, starts acting in a very inappropriate manner, that also tells a lot about him, you know, because you, you, your character is revealed through loss and victory, not just loss. Mm. So I think that's one way of going at it. I don't know if, if I would agree to this extent, you know, like this, because in judo, like you see them, they, they open their jacket, they scream a little bit, they shake their, it's fine. But I think, or like in Kyudo, in Kyudo, part of leaving the, uh, it's because it's part of the ceremony. You see them wearing those white socks. It's part mm. of a ceremony, like weddings, uh, shrines. So it's not like you get the, the arrow into the, into the target and then you're like, you throw your bow, like archery, and you're like, yeah, you know, like ESPN, you see, no, it's, even part of leaving the the space is part of the kata. So either that, it's also telling you that you know, no matter the outcome, just continue being, you know, yourself, yeah. or yeah, to keep grounded, basically, or present, yeah. like grounded. Yeah. Sure, I, I see your point. I think I think you're you're giving good examples, and I think it's uh, also a point where it's possible to kind of bring everything together, and I think just kind of encompassing all all of the subjects we spoke about. I think that's a universal thing, and I always like to come back to the phrase, the right thing is, the, the right way is the way which works. And But then if we don't know where we're heading, how do you know what works? And that, that relates to a quote I like, which is, a, a ship which does not know where it's sailing, for, for it no wind is favorable. Yeah. You know, if you, if you, it's like, and that, that's the same here. If I don't know exactly what's my goal, and what I am aiming to be, and what am I not aiming to be, how can you make sure that you're doing the best things? And I think two confusions happen here. One is there's no clear specific goal and uh, the, the methodology is all, all over the place. Or there's a goal, but it's not pressure tested. And the question is not asked, does this really, do, does, our, do our, does our methodology really deliver this? And, and even like in, I could go and trash Aikido here easily, but I can also choose BJJ as the subject. <laughs> so, uh, but so BJJ, the self-defense system they have, the majority of what I saw, it's pretty crappy. Like it's 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 pretty. It's like it's like Aikido. It's like uh, kata. It's uh, they're not pressure testing their self-defense techniques, and that's crazy because the BJJ itself, it's all about pressure testing, but they're not applying that same mindset to the majority of the self-defense stuff they do. They, they play like kata. And that's like, why are you like, what is this? You know, why are you not taking that same methodology and apply it here? I think one of the answers is because most of the techniques would fail. They would go out of the window and that would be an uncomfortable situation. And most people don't want to face that truth. But that's yeah. the same issue that we have in other martial arts. So do you, do you see what I mean? Yeah, um, that's interesting you mentioned that. I recently had a talk with, Pedro Valente, one of Elio Gracie's last black belts. Mm. And uh, he really loves his teacher, Elio Gracie. And, uh, but at the same time, he really honors. What I can can you give me a second? I'll just plug in my uh, yeah, light. Yeah, yeah, Is sure. that okay? Are you going to edit, edit this or? No, no, keep, uh, I'll keep talking and you go. Yeah, great. I'll just yeah. get my wire. Okay. So I was talking with him and he said, and I talked to him about self-defense particularly is that, um, you know, the Gracie challenges, uh, you had judo that's been around for decades at that point, hand-to-hand uh, -hand instructor, like hand-to-hand -hand instru combat instructors for the police. And I said that there's no way that the only way that they're training is like a kata, dyna uh, static way after they've sparred for decades. I, I, I think they know better. That's basically what I was trying to tell him. And uh, he said, that's true. It's not just 
static kata, although there is a place for that to really learn a technique. Uh, but also, he said that there's also dynamic training, you know, um, just flailing attacks, and also a reflex training where he says, um, you know, his teacher, Elio Gracie, would come up and then suddenly just, you know, try to slap him or pick up something from the back of his belt and try to strike it with it, uh, strike with it. Um, it's basic. So they did just kata, and also they did reflex training and dynamic self defense, and just regular randori, just grappling. Uh, sorry, just a second. Take your time. So, uh, yeah, you would you would think that these people that did these challenges and went against other schools, they would know better um, to pressure test the same you know, self-defense uh, techniques. Mm -hmm. And I think they, they did that in a way. Like even, I think, the old Kodokan Judo, because mm -hmm. they were teaching the police, they were going out and arresting people. There's no way that there's the, a police officer that's doing Judo and has a black belt is only doing Kata. I think they would know a lot better, and I think they would pressure test them. It right. makes zero sense to be this competent technique and develop these sophisticated techniques that break your legs, that smash you on the ground with a throw. And then when it comes to self-defense, you you do this, and grab, and turn, and that's it. Like and there's it it's hard to wrap your head around it. I think they drilled it very much. Just like I said, the, the Kodogan says self-defense and kata. They're two different things. You know, and I think you're right to the majority of the degree, but I also think it's hard, it's definitely hard to wrap the head around it, but I think it happens. And I think it's, uh, it's kind of a, almost like a parallel to the Dunning and Kruger effect, which I'm pretty sure you're familiar with, right? Dunning What's and Kruger. That? It's where the less you know, the more confident you feel, the more you know, the less confident. Oh, yeah. Okay. Right? So, uh, uh, so I'll give it. I'll draw a parallel again and, and give an example of you know Anderson Silva, a famous UFC uh, fighter. Yeah. So there's a infamous knife defense video with him, and that's pretty much you know he's more, more or less retired. He's teaching martial arts and probably he wanted to expand his curriculum, and he's teaching really crappy knife defense, which would not work under pressure. But you know he's a black belt in uh, probably in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. He's you know he's a top fighter. And that 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 that's the confusion with Yana Bernethi's martial map. You know, he thinks that since he mastered one realm, he's good at everything. And whatever wow. he says about knife defense, it's gonna make sense. But that's not true. The knife defense, he's not applying that same mindset to that. And I almost wonder sometimes if BGG people have trouble there too, where it's like, I would want to believe, and I'm speaking, I don't know how it was in the past. I'm pretty sure that they were much more pressure testing things, but today. I would need evidence to, to believe that some of the top BGG people on YouTube who are showing those crappy self-defense moves, that they're really honest with themselves and that they really pressure tested off record. I think it's like, and that's the point I made in my Krav Maga video, these days if something is done, there's a very big percentage chance that you'll see it on YouTube. And if something is not on YouTube, there's a big chance that's not getting done yeah. and i don't see bjj self-defense pressure testing videos because i think i think again there and i'm just half talking out loud and being a bit bold here but i think there's truth to that they are probably in a similar situation like aikido where they're so down the road of making a claim which is untrue that for yeah. them to admit that they're wrong and to backtrack all that way that would be an uncomfortable situation and then we end up doing yeah. shitty things you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's also other problems is you have so many hours in the day. Um, like I'm sure these clubs that have some self-defense in them, you know, maybe, maybe I think that uh, Halsey, Halsey and Gracie, um, even Hickson, uh, I don't know, I'm not going to make, like, give names because I don't know exactly what, but I'm right. assuming that like the bulk of their training is geared towards competition. And when they get to the self-defense, it's like, eh, you know, basic stuff. And yeah. so, I mean, that's one thing also Pedro said to me that our school 
is revolved around self-defense. We do stand up grappling randori on the ground as well, but we have more time to do these live drills in dynamic way, reflex training, because we don't, like when someone comes to us, he said that this is probably not the best school for you if you want to compete. So he's geared a little bit more towards yeah. self-defense and he's teaching um, from the very like static stuff up to, you know, reflex and really dynamic stuff. And I really appreciate what he's doing. I probably should go or see what he's up to. And also, uh, that's what I meant in the beginning when I said, you know, judo is like a, should be like, a, I'm talking about judo because that's all I know. But I'm talking. Sure. Same for me with be, Aikido and more or less it, BJJ. <laughs> yeah. It should be like a big school, like the Kodokan with all types of curriculums like throughout the week and whatever you're geared towards, you go and do. Maybe in a month I have a kata competition. There are kata competitions in judo. I'll train a lot of kata this period and then, you know, go back to self-defense uh, or maybe I'm going for the Olympics. I'm not going to do self-defense, obviously, but yeah. I think, you know, you should be very heavy on, you know, self-defense, not just the basics because for some reason, like, as you just said, it's stuck in the very, very, very primitive um, stage, but everything yeah. else we go through like balls to the walls, but when it yeah. comes to self-defense, we don't have time. Sure. I think there there may be, a, and I'm thinking out loud here because I don't think I have a final answer, but uh, so actually I, um, so I released the Krav Maga video today, a couple of them, and one of them I'm talking with a former Krav Maga instructor. We're going to go on record on Friday, so I'm sure we're going to talk about that more, but he made a very good point that uh, he's he's teaching hardcore self-defense. They're like, they're going at it. Like, if you, have you seen Matt of Reality Check Self-Defense? No. Uh, there's a channel like he has 10,000 subscribers at the moment. He he pressure tests self defense techniques, but he goes for it. Like he 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 asks people to kick him in the balls. He gets cut. Like he he sacrifices himself to prove a point. And uh, so he's actually this a student. Matt is a student of uh, Jeff Phillips, who's the former Krav Maga instructor. So they're going balls at the wall. You know, they're like really like going with the full full on attacks full pressure they're not damaging each other but but they're really giving intense pressure and he made a good point that most people are not interested in that they don't want that type of intensity and also too there's the other aspect which is the theoretical part you know what to do what not to do and how to talk how not to talk and all those things most people for for most people that's boring especially if you haven't been in a life or death situation and you're highly motivated to know what to do if that ever happens again but if you've never been in that situation it's hypothetical for you so you're kind of like you're interested but but you don't want to sit there for two hours and listen to like every day and listen to the person telling you what happens yeah. in a self-defense situation so that's i think that's one of the tricky parts and that's i experienced that the same thing although shortly although briefly but when i finished this peer self-defense certification course I tried, I was still running my Kido Dojo and I tried to do like a self-defense class once once per week. And after like a few classes, it was really hard to maintain membership because I would more or less convey the main aspects of what people need to know. And then it was just deep diving. And most people were not interested to deep dive. They're like, we want to learn some cool new moves, you know. And I think that that may be, I'm still just hypothetically thinking, but that may be one of the reasons why it's why self-defense is not so big in pretty much any a martial arts or combat sports school because it doesn't sell which is crazy but but that could mo almost be like a question how do you sell self-defense maybe you just do like one class per month or or but, but with combat sports it's, it's great because you you compete at high level eventually and you're able to deal with high level guys and that means you will be able to take care of random guys but at the same time what about the bottle what about the broken glass what about you know concrete floor those questions if they're not addressed then then there's a dissonance but most people are not interested in that so so it's kind of a confusing situation like a difficult situation too i think yeah there's all sorts of aspects like someone's aggressive nature like you can feel their energy like you should custom yourself to not be like scared or nervous around that too not just uh you know the model or like, how to handle yourself right. that's also very good. Uh, there's also uh, just just a small side note. Uh, someone uh, on Patreon mentioned to me that uh, 
there's also knife defense ways is that the knife will tase you. Mm, yeah, yeah, I heard so about it. Oh, you would really want to avoid it. Right, yeah. So that's, sure. that's a very good one. Um, also, I think a lot of the people that just want self-defense, they're, I mean, this is me just reflecting on my own past experience. I was terrified of doing just sparring. I was just, the, the whole idea, because of what I went through in school, the whole idea of sparring just terrified me. That's why Aikido was so appealing. Can you so clarify sparring? Did you, sorry, just to clarify, sparring, do you mean grappling to you or hand-to-hand -hand sparring? Hand to, like, just combat. Okay. Like, the idea of sparring at someone, they're trying to hit me or they're trying to throw me or they're trying to Okay, so me. all types of sparring, all levels. Yeah, of it yeah, terrified. Like, a lot of people, they're probably still stuck in that stage, uh, unfortunately. And I, I think because we went through like a lot of sports type of uh, doing randori, we not only viewed the value of it because we come from Aikido, but also uh, we know enough that it should be added to those other um, self-defense drills or scenarios or uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I guess there, there's a different points that apply here, but like I think a fascinating moment is the one you mentioned that people, I think a lot, the majority of people who go to Aikido are the peaceful bunch, the intellectual bunch. And I was like that too. You, you may know from my stories that I was a peaceful kid. I did not want to fight. I didn't want, did not want, right. I did not like violence. I did not feel like hitting anyone. And Aikido was like, oh, I won't have to use violence and I will become like Steven Seagal. You know, that's like amazing. And that's, that's appealing. But at, at the same time, you know, that's a lie. That's uh, like you, and I, I made that quote in the today's video about Karma God, but I say, you fight how you train. And if your training is cooperative and without pressure, without spontaneity. Compared to two, like, with them. Yeah, right, so, yeah. right. So basically, you know, it's like, I think somebody made this Joe comment, which I liked a lot, which who said, I don't remember which video of mine it was, but it was kind of pushing that idea about you fight how you train. And somebody wrote, it almost seems like if you want to learn how to fight, you should fight, you should fight. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was Joe comment. But I was like, yeah, yeah, it's like, it makes so much sense when you think about it. It's like, you know, get used to getting punched in the face and et cetera. And then, you know, if that's what you're afraid of, and that's what even like uh, the name just dropped for me, Jeff, but Jeff Thompson, yeah. uh, you know, the godfather of self-defense, <laughs> one of the godfathers, he, is, he was apparently super afraid of things, but he uh, invested deeply into overcoming fear. And one of the, the, his strategies from what I know was desensitizing, desensitizing himself. I don't, I won't say necessarily do that, but he was afraid of spiders. So he was holding a spider until he just wouldn't, he would become numb to it, although yeah. he was scared as hell of it, you know. And I think, you know, that, that can apply to, I'm I'm afraid of getting punched in the face. Why would I, if, if you're thinking like step a step ahead, why would I go to Aikido where I'm not going to dabble with that? Yeah. But a disclaimer, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying getting punched in the face is for everyone. And I don't say everyone should go to boxing and get trashed and to MMA. It's like, I don't think you necessarily have to get punched in the face. But if that's really on your mind, if you're always concerned about that, which I was too, it's like, it just makes, it would it would, have been, would have made so much sense to go to a good gym, which keeps you safe, because I think that's another fear. There's a fear that I'll go there and I'll be eaten alive because, you know, I'm, a, I'm not really like that type of person. But if you go to a good gym, good teachers, good instructors, they're going to take care of you and and you learn, you get used to getting punched in the face, you get used to punching others, and after a couple of months, you're good to go and, and problem solved for the rest of your life. But instead, we're carrying that problem like for decades, which I did as well, yeah. and it's like, that's crazy. So anyway, I'm going on a tangent, but I, again, I think you... you no, know. no, no, you're, you're right. People think that if I go to sport, I'm going to look like, a, like the post-UFC uh, right. fight like, or like the ground it's you see it it's all but that's not gonna happen but you know uh the people there's misconceptions all over the place and especially those who don't know martial arts and they, they are like how do you say uh they need to hear the truth the most because they're not they should know i, I would 
when I wanted to start BJJ, I was so terrified. I thought like they're gonna break my arm or they're gonna break my leg. And I saw those compilations like people getting injured and it terrified me, you know, mm-hmm. it, which is understandable, you know. But sure. uh, but once you go, you start rolling with them, you tap out and they let you go. They're smiling at you. They're talking with you. Then you go outside, you grab a coffee and you hang out with them. You would see that it's totally different and people should not be afraid of going in and tapping out or I mean, I am afraid a little bit of beginners when they box because of the brain sure. damage and they don't really know. But when in terms of grappling, because that's all I know, uh, people don't be afraid unless, you know, someone is like going really aggressive, like, a, like we call them spazzy white belt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please like stop the fight and tell them, hey, you're going too hard and I'm afraid you might injure me or injure yourself. Please go easier. Tell them. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, there's another point I also remembered that I wanted to share and uh, bringing it back to pressure testing self-defense and doing the thing which works. Uh, I really like the story from Tony Blower, the founder of Spear uh, self-defense system, where he was a martial artist pretty much his whole life. He was training you know, traditional martial arts, I think, in combat sports. And he was teaching this kind of uh, combat sports, semi-ish self-defense class, I think. You know, I'm just retelling the story. But basically, one of his students one day came in and said uh, he had like a black eye, I think. And Tony asked him, like, what happened? You know, what's the black eye with? And he was like, well, I got attacked in my school. I got punched. And 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 Tony's like, why didn't you, you know, why didn't you do this? Or why didn't you die? Why didn't you just like slip the punch or whatever? And the student said, well, I I, I was carrying a bunch of books in one hand. And he grabbed me by the collar and pushed me to the lockers, and I, I, I didn't know what to do from that situation. And he then apologizes to Tony, saying, sorry, I failed you. And Tony, the brilliant part, which I think made him brilliant, is he said, no, you shouldn't be apologizing to me. I should be apologizing to you, because that, that was the light bulb moment for him, because he realized, I didn't teach you what to do when you are holding books and when somebody pushes you by the wall. Like, that was not in the curriculum. And then for the rest of the class, they trained specifically that and then that's where scenario training came into his mind but i think that uh, there's there's two things here which are great is first of all addressing real problems but the second one is that honesty i think that's what is often missing from the martial arts world and and all levels all all types where the instructors are not honest enough to stop and to question is this really gonna work what I'm teaching because you know I think I think in combat sports the combat aspect the sports aspect the pressure testing is really clear and if you're not doing what works you you'll fail you'll lose it's very evident you know it's very clear whether things work or not and whatever doesn't work gets thrown away uh, all the time but then when you come to self defense and the in the pressure testing is very intense there and there's a much bigger chance that the pressure testing won't happen and it's much easier to fool ourselves that we're doing a good job, but but that's not really true. But I think that's where that's where a bit of honesty is missing from many instructors. And and that reminds me also of a quote uh, I used it for one of my titles too, with a conversation with Ian Abernethy, a practical karate guy. He said martial arts instructors are the worst self defense instructors, and I think it's it's to a degree very true because there's so much that martial arts instructors are identified with and attached that it's hard for them to let go because self-defense i think if you if you make it if you go to the essence of it it's very simple you know it's very primal and if you have some good throws judo throws or or grip losing techniques like those are going to go great but it's not like you don't need to learn a thousand self-defense techniques for a self-defense situation which i think we're sorry 67 throws of judo Right, exactly. It's like there's a couple which will most likely work and you'll be good. And I think that's, again, where Krav Maga kind of fails as well. They're like, I think in order to sell themselves, and I'm talking, I'm thinking out loud here, but I think I mentioned to you that problem of uh, martial arts where they, it, or self-defense, that it's hard to sell self-defense because it's not as sexy, it's not as appealing. But then they have like 60 different techniques that you need to learn to become a black belt in Krav Maga and 
and there's level one, there's level two, they, they, they fell to the same problem, probably for marketing reasons, to make sure that they have something to sell. And that's, again, that's being dishonest. You're putting a different um, goal as a priority without probably even realizing. It's, it's, it's like it's more about maintaining membership and selling my product versus yeah. does this really work? And I think not enough people stop to ask themselves, does this really work? Am I really teaching the right thing? And, and how do I know that I'm teaching the right thing? Did I put myself out there and did I ask my student to really try to stab me with this you know, pencil or whatever? So yeah. I, I, it's it's a problem on all fronts. The, like you just said, stab me with a pencil. <laughs> How many scenarios are there? Like, is, did did someone come and define like these are the self defense scenarios? I don't think anyone can actually do that. Yeah, sure. Self defense, like you can be sitting on the chair, you can be lying in the beach, you can be on the stairs. There's walk, walking the streets. Right. There's like a million different scenarios. But I think there's, you know, there are certain principles. Like I think it's, and I, I'm not saying I, I'm, I'm 100% right. I'm just kind of philo in a philosophical mood today, I guess. But I did like what I did like in Spear is that there was a lot of scenario uh, training, yeah. and and we would like, especially if somebody would ask, would come in and be like. So what do you do if you're sitting? Because I think we all have those weird questions. Like yeah. you know, we've been in a situation or a friend was, or we thought about it. It's like, what if I'm sitting and drinking coffee and somebody comes and grabs me? And we're like, the, the go-to answer in, in Spear is, let's do this. Let's try this. You know, and you sit down and you're pretending you, you grab a cup and somebody comes and grabs you and, and you start with light pressure, you add medium pressure and, and you see what happens, what works. But by scenario three or four or five, you start to see that the answer is very similar. There are certain differences, like you know, you need to take the environment into your into into account. But kind of the the way you respond once you've been there, you know, it's like, like and even Spear has this. Uh, again, I'm not saying best self defense ever system or anything, but I did like the concept of uh, closest weapon, closest target, which is which is aiming to teach you to consider okay. If the person is here, what weapon, and that weapon can be my head, my elbow, my fist, a phone I have, whatever. But like what weapon connects with the closest target? If his head is here and my head is here, I might as well just hit him yeah. with the head instead of you know trying to jab when I'm crunched or whatever. Or maybe if I know a judo fro, it's like, oh, the judo fro is here, the most ideal scenario. But after you go through this process like 10 times, it becomes evident. You're like, oh, that's best. That's best. That's best. But un but unless you do that, you know, you don't draw the bridge. And if you get into that situation, maybe your reflexes will work, but maybe not. If you never tried applying yourself, putting yourself in a crazy condition, like, I don't know, carrying two bags of groceries and somebody attacks you and like, I'm not used to doing this in my class. But if you did it once, you're like, you know, your brain works better. So again, I'm going in a tangent here, but I'm just kind of make, trying to make a point. I think it doesn't take that much to include some scenario training to just be, become comfortable at that. And I think that's that's already more than enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah, just be uh, be um, well versed or well, uh, how do you say? Um, be well. Uh, uh, <laughs> you can cut state. this out. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, no, no, no. It's fine. Uh, you should be accustomed, or uh, in French is habitué. You know, to have the habit. Yeah, be have the habit of you know someone startling you, surprising you, and then from there you just see whatever is available. Maybe they they grab you here. You just put you right. shake your hand and then turn around the chair. Try to get up. You don't want to be giving them your back all the time and standing down, uh, sitting down. But I, like, I think after some time you get to uh, think rather quickly and, right. you know, just like, you know, you create the distance, you know, you do all the stuff uh, with basic self-defense creating angles. I think they can apply to all situations. Um, right, yeah. You know, just and like a double leg can apply when you're sitting down, someone comes to you like that. Uh, right. Uh, example you show like someone was sitting down and someone was picking on him and he just grabbed his leg and right. reaped them i mean that's yeah yeah, yeah. 
yeah, and uh, we don't need to dig much deeper into this anymore, but uh, there's just one more thing I wanted to share. Uh, and that reminds me of one of my very first conversations when I was on that journey to realize, okay, what's the difference between self-defense, martial arts, and combat sports? And I was talking to Paul Sharp, uh, who for the record is uh, ex, um, off, ex-police ex officer, was on the undercover, was in the SWAT team. Like, So he's, you know, he's badass and he's really like into what he's a bgg black belt but he's also into what works in self-defense shooting everything so so he pressure tests his self-defense and this is one of my first conversations where i asked a person who really has that correct experience um, suitable experience to answer so what what about like uh people who are in combat sports uh how far are they from being good self-defense people because there's a big debate and many people are like oh they make this point like and this, I think, is a bit obnoxious to say, but it's like if you're a pure judo player and somebody taps, you'll have the reflexes to let them go in the street. I'm like, I don't know if that's really true, but, you know, that's kind of really like pushing it far. It's like, oh, yeah. if you're an MMA, then you're just, you know, you'll just focus on one person. And th that may be true to some degree. But then uh, I really like what Paul Sharp said. He said that when he was teaching self-defense courses, like this realistic pressure test to self-defense, he said you you would see a clear difference between civilians and uh, like regular people and people who are training in combat sports. They needed some tweaking. Like he was the expert to come and say, well, you know, like don't pull guard, you know, in the street or yeah. or, you know, don't don't clinch this way. Just be mindful because there can be a knife. But his point was that you just need to tweak them a little bit and then they're like they're like the beasts of the street. Like you do not want to fuck with them because they're not only good at combat sports, but they also know what to do and what not to do in self distinction. Yeah. And those people are dangerous. And I think it, uh, it's uh, this phrase from Paul Sharp, which I like a lot, uh, that it's all about making good people dangerous. And, and, and I think that's a good point that, you know, combat sports is not enough to, to be a self-defense person, like a suitable at self-defense. You're going to be better at it than a regular person. Probably. But uh, if you don't know combat sports and you know self-defense, it's going to be good. But if you know combat sports and you know self-defense, somebody's not lucky when they attack you. <laughs> and, you know, there's never... Right. Like, 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 more, at your judo school, we all do randori all the time, rounds after rounds. But, change, but everyone has like some focus, but we all share this very big uh, thing, which we spar all the time in grappling. Like all judo, that's what they would do. They would train the police, the army. But when in time, when it's time to go against each other, test each other, they throw out the grappling for safety re the the striking. I'm sorry, for safety yeah. reasons. And they had a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to do rounds and rounds and rounds of sparring. Let's face it, it's fun. It, they're doing just self defense is not fun. And I understand why these people are dropping out. But sparring, taking a throw, throwing someone with throws that you will never use on the streets, like. I would never go for a sacrifice throw on the street ever. Sure, yeah. But I win with it all the time. But because it's fun, yeah. You know, yeah. it's uh, there's a there's a very important aspect to sparring, having fun and really just being explosive and really uh, être habitué. <laughs> having I know a bit French, so I know what you mean, but not everyone gets it. So, but yeah, I want to say custom like a million times. So. Uh, and I'm not even sure if the word is correct. So, um, and then go do self-defense. If you're very into self-defense, maybe you're into competing in kata because you like the ceremonial aspect, just like those who do flower arrangements or tea ceremony or uh, kudo or iaido. There's there's that aspect in judo when you go and compete in kata. Uh, there's also police self-defense where you know you're being attacked all the time. There is you know I want to be all Japan national champion or you know, national champion. But we all come around and do randori in classes and the open mass should be for everyone. You know, like a two days a week where all these guys just come in and just spar the hell out of each other. Yeah. That's the best. that's how I see a judo sure. school being the best. You know, it caters to all the needs and also at the same time the, um, addressing uh, why judo was found in the first place. It's not just for the Olympics. Yeah, you made a you made a few great points here, but something I also just wanted to put some emphasis on is you mentioned that safety aspect, where it's like, oh, we don't add strikes because it's too dangerous. I think it's a not not a really true and honest statement from the martial arts community. Like that whole thing, 
oh, Bujin Khan is too deadly, and if we would use Bujin uh, Khan, and wait, you know, and me, it's like let me let me elaborate. Um, okay, they can only grapple. Like if I can do a Keizagatami, which is the headlock with the arm, like the scarf hold, and beat you. Like I'd like obviously you're gonna you'd rather lose by the pin than me to just pounding your head with hammer fists in Keizagatami. That's what I meant. Like taking yeah, sure and just I'm not off some options that can be dangerous with the grappling. Right. I'm not saying and it's too deadly or it's just a way that to practice and staying safe because for Kano it was also for education and of course staying right. safe. Yeah. There's no yeah. Yeah. Uh, like Morihei Yoishi but there's no like, what did he say? There's no victory in injuring someone else. Mm. Like obviously yeah. that's going to happen unintentionally but uh, it's just a way to keep safe and having fun like they took out the striking and they really worked on the grappling when they tested against each other. But grappling for but striking in self defense and kata, they did that quite a lot. Quite quite a lot. Sure. Yeah. Well, that's and I'm, so I wanted. Maybe I should add a disclaimer. I'm not seeing this particularly for your situation or putting this on you, but just in general, there is that thing in martial arts where it's like we don't spar or we don't add strikes because it's too dangerous. But it's like, I think that's an in, inadequate statement because like you can add slaps and you can just like already, like if you add slaps, yeah. light, light taps in BJJ, that changes the game quite dramatically because you're suddenly like, oh, I can't just sit here with my closed guard. I need to, you know, close the distance. I need to sweep. But it, but that's like all it takes, a little bit of a slap. But people are thinking, most martial artists are thinking either, you know, zero or 100%. Or I'm saying to some people like, they're like, no, no, I, like agree, I, agree, I agree. No, I'm not yeah. saying like that's how it should be 100%, but yeah. uh, in terms of, you know, judo being a grappling based sport, you know, you should practice your grappling in this way. Like you're, you're really concentrating on that grappling and do nothing but, but grappling, which make them like the best grapplers basically in the gi. Sure. Um, but I was saying like, yes, of course you can add that, but uh, that's at least that's how I understood it. For example, before he would grab his head, put it on the on the beam of the dojo, and he would just crush it. Like there was some very nasty stuff. They really phased them out. We went transitioning from like all jujitsu to judo. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if you want to add some taps, maybe do a few rounds with that, and then just a few few rounds where you really craft your grappling. Like obviously, there's no right or wrong way to do this, but I'm saying that you know, just do whatever. But, basically mm. yeah well i wanted to give you a heads up that i still have like five minutes and then i'll have to go uh yeah. so is there anything else juicy that you want to cover before we wrap this up today uh yes it's um a little bit of uh, douchiness i experienced in aikido i'm sure <laughs> stories uh, i disclaimer i i'm i we live in an age where you have to start every sentence with not everyone but there is <laughs> So I was one, there was once um, we were training Kotegeshi and we were doing the Okemi and I remember I was training with this very tiny woman and she did this Kotegeshi and I did the Okemi and then when I landed all of a sudden I, I didn't see because it was just so like lightning fast someone landed on my ribs it was a very very fat man landed on my ribs and I couldn't breathe and I was so scared that my ribs were broken or shattered and I couldn't breathe and Bruno Gonzalez picked me up. He sat me outside of the of the um, the mats and he, he guided me through breathing and then I went and stood back up and I got on the mats again and there was this lady, the other lady came to me and uh, she says, are you okay? Uh, and then she said, it was X who fell on you and I saw X. He was like with his training partner and they were like snickering. <laughs> yeah. So like if you see, some, if you did that to someone and they can't breathe and they were sat outside, like would it, like the first thing you would do is go check on them, right? Yeah, first of all, apologize and then like, hey, are you okay? What can I do to help you? Yeah. Like, wouldn't that be like the humane first response? Like sure. I would never forget this because like, how can you find this funny? And I was in so much pain. I. I had like some bruises the next day and I immediately went to, to the doctor because like it could have been broken. 
and yeah. causing internal bleeding or whatever. And he's just a very fat man doing a break fall on you. Yeah. And that really, really, really just pissed me off. And I, I never saw such thing happen again, like in judo or anywhere else. Like even BJJ classes that I took, never saw this type of behavior. Another time where I did another landing and I landed a little bit close to someone's legs. And he, he looked at me like, like he was like almost pissed. And then just like, uh, like with his both knees, like almost pushed me. Um, there are some really weird people, and I think they could use some sparring. They should be tapped out at least twice. Yeah, hundred percent. And uh, you know, this could be a deep rabbit hole, and it's a big question I used to ask myself: is like, why did I meet proportionally more douchebags? And I hear this statement like from a lot of people that uh, who went who transitioned from traditional martial arts world to the combat sports. Uh, a lot of people say the same that there's a lot more douchiness in traditional martial arts. Not everyone, tr definitely true, but there's proportionally much more douchiness there. Uh, and I thought a lot about it, and you may know my argument. Uh, I think that's because of the, the dynamics of how the power structure is set up. First right. of all, there's a lack of failing. Uh, and second, there's a hierarchy which is based not on your true performance, but more on how long you train and and how how well you copy what your teacher said so if you're a shitty person there's like and that's that brings me to my point about where i said pressure testing all aspects including virtues there's no pressure testing mechanism for it like if you're a good person likely you'll be a good black belt too but if you're a shitty person and then you get into a position of power that will elevate it but those people usually either they um, transform in combat sports or they drop out entirely. I think majority of them just drop out because it's too much for their ego. But in traditional martial arts, the ego maniacs, they can become like high, high level grades. Yeah, I, I agree. Like that washing away and polishing of the spirit, uh, in my opinion, should be translated through tapping out. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's just we 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 all hate failing. Yeah. It's 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 very it's, it's embarrassing. To go. Right. But then again, I, as I said, like most traditional martial arts, as, as soon as you get to a certain level, the failing rate just completes to just continues to drop off and drop off. And the other meanwhile, in uh, in combat sports, it's it's not unusual for the instructor to be tapped out by one of his students or to have a guest who will tap them out. And if that person in combat sports avoid rolling with their students and with guests, now probably we're going to see that same issue happening sooner or later. But the culture is set up to pressure test and to to add that quality to the instructor. While in traditional martial arts, instructors are actually uh, spared from that. They're actually they have a structure where that's not going to happen. So and you end up with that being problem. It's, uh, I basically like to say that it's systematic. People think it's a coincidence, but it's just, it's a consequence of the way pe things are structured, I'd say. Yeah, like there's even Aikido where, I'm sure you'd know this, but you don't, you can't even do a technique or have a partner with a professor. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I like, like not I even remember, do a technique with them. Yeah, I remember like in my, with my main Aikido instructor, if we were in a big seminar, he would ch cherry pick the people he would train with and i was eventually i was you know one of the top people so i was one of the two or three people he would like bow to to train when yeah. he was not teaching but even then he made it very clear that he's the boss you know the way he did the technique and the way he did ukemi it was like ukemi was half-assed it wasn't like really like spot on and and sincere and the the, the techniques also were very much like you know i am the sensei here i'm like oh. when i look back i'm like holy fuck <laughs> but you know yeah. it is what it is yeah well uh, yeah i'll have to go in a minute so uh, shall we wrap this up yeah yeah it was a great talk thank you again uh again i'm very thankful for what all you do and you know documenting this journey that i'm sure it helped so many of us not just me so again thank you very much for taking the time and sitting down with me today well thank you for inviting it was i was really happy to to have the talk as well and it just again means a lot for me to see how you're impacting people and how you're doing this, I think, you know, you're doing the same thing. So, so that's brilliant. That's really cool. Thank you. So, uh, and uh, I don't know, maybe this is off record just quickly to check. Uh, was the talk okay for you? Did we cover the subjects you wanted to 
touch or how, how, yeah, yeah. how was yeah, it? Was, I wanted it to be a very flowing conversation. Okay. Cool. Yeah, because well, I'm sure topics lead to other topics. If you know two experienced people in the same fields can sit down, I'm sure it's going to be an interesting talk. So. Nice, cool. Well, let me know when it's out. I'll promote it on my uh, media, social media, and uh, I'll also somewhere down the road will want to invite you on my live stream, and then we can focus more on on your opinion and on judo and how BJJ sucks. <laughs> so, that's no, I don't, never said BJJ sucks because it I is know, a part no, of it's judo. Good. It's it's the the uh, group, mostly the ground part of judo. Um, the, it's basically the the myths and the narratives that just are a bit irritating. That's it. And I'm very glad that I put a big stop to it. Yeah, th I'm very glad you're doing that too. Somebody has to do it. So that's super cool. Yeah, like going through the footage, cutting them down and comparing yeah. them to new techniques, etc. It's not an easy thing, but I, sure. all I did was just point them out. People ask me like, where do you get these footage? Like, they're all on YouTube. I, I didn't get yeah. them from like my magical place. Yeah. But you just have to take the time to really go through them, study them to have enough technical maturity to understand what you're saying. Sure. Then cut them down and just show them. Yeah. That's it. Nice. Well, cool. Uh, thanks again for everything. Uh, let's keep in touch. Let me know if you need anything else. I really have to go now, but it was a pleasure. Right. Thank you for having me. Thank you. All right. See have you soon. Bye, Robert.